Welcome everybody. We're very happy to um, get going with today's webinar. Um, Flying Jewels, a photographic journey of select hummingbird species of the US and the Bahamas. And um, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, say where you're from in the chat if you like. It's always great to see where everybody's tuning in from. And we will be taking questions and having discussion at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A panel, um, your um, Zoom tools, and we will um, provide, um, answer those questions um, that are posed for Anne or any of the other panelists at the end of the webinar. All right, so um, go ahead and give me the next slide, Anne. Uh, just a quick introduction and background in case you're new to Birds Caribbean. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to the conservation of birds and their habitats throughout all the islands of the West Indies. And we work with local partners throughout all the islands to um, help build capacity and help people learn about birds and appreciate them and enjoy them. So we do a lot of outreach and education. We promote science, we promote conservation action, we raise grant money and, and um, hold training workshops. Lots of exciting things. I encourage you to follow us um, on our social media and also sign up for our monthly newsletter. And um, also check out our journal, Journal of Caribbean Ornithology, where we present um, scientific information from um, many researchers throughout the region and beyond. Okay, next slide. And right now we have our Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival ongoing. This is happening throughout April and May. So we're getting close to winding down the festival now. Um, we've been celebrating um, the 171 endemic birds that are found in the Caribbean islands and nowhere else in the world, which is really phenomenal. Next slide. So during this festival, we've been featuring an endemic bird of the day. We started this last year during the pandemic and a virtual festival, a campaign called From the Nest. And last year we featured 50 species from our endemic birds of the West Indies coloring book. This year we're doing 30 new species. We have drawings by um, Josmar Esteban Marquez that are absolutely fantastic. These are coloring pages. We have activity sheets for kids, videos, bird calls and songs. And throughout April and May and even into June, we'll be having these, we'll be having these weekly webinars Thursdays at 4 p.m. So do check us out, CBF from the nest using that bit.ly link. Next slide. And the other thing that we have going on right now is a bird zine contest. It's our first ever bird zine contest. And you may be wondering what a zine is. It's like a mini booklet filled with your ideas, your words, your pictures, and your artwork. This, it, this can be handmade, like a hard copy, you know, with hand-drawn lettering and pictures. Um, it's like a collage um, of things, or you can make one that's digital. And the deadline for submission is May 30th. And we've got some really fantastic prizes in different age categories, including two grand prizes of the brand new pairs of binoculars. So we encourage you to check that out and enter your bird zine. We're gonna be making a library of all these different zines that are about Caribbean birds to share with everybody. We've already gotten some really cool submissions. So we hope you'll consider submitting one as well if you haven't heard about this contest. Next slide. And the other thing that we have going on right now also is we're collecting videos, short videos from everybody. You can just film these yourself on your phone. We just need two or three sentences maximum or one minute maximum. And we just wanna know um, what does uh, sing, fly, soar like a bird mean to you? That's the theme for our endemic bird festival. All right, and the deadline for submitting your video for that is May 31st. Again, check that out on our website using that bit.ly link, and we would love to hear from you. We're gonna to put together a compilation of everybody's um, thoughts on what, what this theme means to you. All right, next slide. And then finally, we have an, another uh, webinar coming up next week, the same time. This is on bioacoustics, using bird sounds to inform the conservation of an island endemics. So we'll be having two ornithologists join us for this exciting webinar. Um, Mark Hume from the University of the West Indies talking about the Powie, the um, Trinidad piping guan, which is a crit critically endangered bird. And then Tanya Martinez, who's worked for many years on the recovery of the Puerto Rican parrot, talking about vocal evolution of parrots. So that will be really exciting. 
And then the week after that, I don't have a graphic to show for it yet. We'll have Scott, uh, Chris Johnson and um, Angelina Davis talking about uh, surveying birds in the Bahamas and how things are going after Hurricane Dorian. So that'll be another great webinar as well. All right, next slide. Okay, so that's all I have for my short introduction. Just encourage you to follow us, become a member, sign up for a monthly newsletter. And um, I'm now ready to turn it over to Ann Maddock. Um, she's gonna introduce herself and our other guest panelists that are joining us today. We're, welcome, Ann, we're really excited to have you to talk about your gorgeous new book, which I wanna say Ann kindly sent me a copy and it's incredible. The photographs are just stunning. The information is really well organized and put together, really comprehensive. So I encourage you to check that out and get a copy for yourself. So take it away, Anne. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, and appreciate this opportunity to uh, reach so many people through your organization. I'm Anne Maddock and I was an educator for 45 years, recently retired, yes, yes, yes. And um, started photographing hummingbirds a little over 10 years ago. And so I put together this book and wrote it and uh, just released it. Um, and the reason that I did this book is because I wanted to not just put pretty pictures or photos of hummingbirds out there, but to show um, at least three characteristics of the species or the gender of the species so that each photo would be sharp, detailed and show those characteristics. So people that don't usually get a chance to see those types of things um, would be able to see how gorgeous these books, I mean, these birds really are. The birds that are in the presentation today, unless it's mentioned otherwise, they're my photographs. And um, most of them are not in the book. I've saved the best ones for in the book. Erica? Well, I'd just like to say a little bit about uh, Anne and uh, Sydney. And bird lovers, as well as expert birders, recognize Anne as the expert hummingbird behavior in the Bahamas. She has gained this reputation through years of dedication in spending days and hours in the field in her quest for the perfect photo of each species. I was delighted to have Anne and Sydney stay with us for this fascinating project of hers two weeks at a time for several years. She would be sitting in our bird sanctuary or at Garden of the Groves for eight hours a day, snapping away about 500 photos each session. Well, it actually took Anne 11 years to complete her mission. But I would be amiss if I did not mention that Sydney is the other half of Anne's success. The reason they actually came to the Bahamas each winter was Sydney's contract with Environment Canada, conducting the endangered piping plover research along the beaches of our islands. He has supported Anne's passion for hummingbirds and patiently shared evaluating and selecting her best photos for the book. Big hugs and congratulations to you, Sydney. Okay, a little bit, and I agree. He, he was a huge, <laughs> huge partner in this adventure. Um, today's topics are in front of you. Some facts about all hummingbirds we're gonna start with and some things about native to hummingbirds to the Bahamas. And most of the rest of this has to do with behaviors. And then we're gonna wrap up with what uh, was or was not seen as a result of Hurricane Dorian on, on uh, Grand Bahama. Excuse me, Anne. Yes. Did you want to let the other speakers also introduce themselves on the previous oh my slide? Gosh. No How worries. I am so sorry. <laughs> Not a big deal, but I know we had that as the plan. So <laughs> <I'll let everybody laughs> So oh Go gosh. For Go forth. Scott, I believe you were next. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm Scott Johnson. I'm a wildlife biologist and science officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Tara. Hi, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Lindo, a bird guide 
from Great Inagua, that's the furthest island to the south in the Bahamas. Um, and we're also um, the best kept secret. So if you guys want to, you know, discover the secret, you guys can come up to Great Inagua, hit me up and we can do that. We can make that happen. And Erica. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. You already know I'm Erica Gates and uh, I'm also a member of Birds Caribbean as well as a former bird member, happy to say. My husband and I are the owners and operators of Grand Bahama Nature Tours, and we are also running the Garden of the Groves, a 10 acre tropical garden on Grand Bahama Island. We are hosting many visiting birders at our Grand Bahama Birders B and B, also known as Garden of the Gates. Our private one acre bird sanctuary at the BNB, uh, which is an eBird hotspot with 122 species recorded. I'm very happy to have been asked by Anne to be part of this event today. And I would like to thank Lisa and Birds Caribbean for bringing the news of Anne's book publication to every country and corner of the Caribbean through this presentation. Thank you very much, well said. Okay, now I'm worried. I'm worried. <laughs> um, Lisa, are you speaking? Because you yeah. were just mute. Yes, sorry. Um, I just want to say I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. I forgot. So <laughs> you're not the only one. So in case anybody doesn't know me, I'm Lisa Sorensen, Executive Director of Birds Caribbean. And just again, welcome everybody. And thank you to all the panelists and Anne for being with us today. So Anne, take it away. Okay, I'm getting worried about advancing the slides. <laughs> All right, so some facts. Um, the facts about um, the various uh, um, hummingbirds, we're gonna talk about all hummingbirds in general, just to begin with, because they have so many uh, traits that we wanna make sure that people, whether they're new to looking at hummingbirds or uh, even more advanced to refresh their memories on some of the things that might be happening with hummingbirds. And we'll move down to some behaviors here that are um, unique to hummingbirds and then end up with uh, some conversation about what we did and didn't, what we did and did not see um, in, or as a result of Hurricane Dorian on Grand Bahama. So the next couple of slides are about all hummingbirds. This is a black chinned from Arizona that's on this uh, photo here. And the, uh, there are approximately 300 species of hummingbirds. 17 breed in the United States, and there's three that are native to the Bahamas, and those are the ones that we're focusing on today. Hummingbirds are only in the Western Hemisphere. And it's so funny because every time I watch a show uh, that's filmed in Britain, and you see all these gorgeous flowers, and you just want to, uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, there should be hummingbirds there, but they're not. And so the, um, the interesting thing is that they're in just the Western hemisphere. Their wings beat on average between 12 to 80 times per second, depending on the species. They weigh less than a nickel and their heartbeat 1200 beats per minute at average, depending on the size of a particular species. And that's why they're hovering. So during most of the ones that are in North America migrate and they migrate to Central and South America. And that migration, those that are in the United States, some of those are migrating two and 3,000 miles um, one way um, or round trip. And in order to do these magnificent feats of migration, and especially where they live up in the colder climates, um, they go into what is called torpor. And torpor is a type of hibernation and most hummingbirds go into it at night and it will reduce their, um, it will reduce their, um, I'm sorry, their metabolism by about uh, down by 15% and it will allow them to really, really slow down. They won't have to eat. It's like a mini hibernation and it happens at night and in the morning they wake up. Um, they do this also when food is scarce. So this really helps them if they're in an environment such as the wildfires out west, um, 
and in areas that after a hurricane um, and at night. So it's important for another reason when they go into the state of torpor, they also, that means when they come out of it and before they go into it, they really need to eat a lot. And we'll talk about why that's important. Their food sources, hummingbirds, 50% of nectar from flowers. And what most people don't realize is that they also need about 50% of their diet for protein. And that's from soft bodied insects, not hard bodied, but soft bodied. The uh, hummingbirds ha are, have co um, evolved along with the long tubular flowers. And by using their beak and their long tongues that go into um, the flower down to the base to get the nectar, they help in pollination. Um, and just as another aside, their tongues are so extremely long and they actually curl back up inside of their head. So some basic facts about hummingbirds. Um, the iridescence is an important topic because most of us know a hummingbird or two species from wherever we might live and you'll see a color and that color that you see is usually the bright flashy color is from iridescence. However, um, the rest of the colors on the body are, are pigments and you see them like the green and the beige. Those are just pigment, pigmented colors. But the iridescence is actually due to the person that's uh, the viewing angle for, of the person and the light coming through a particular feather. So each feather gives off a slightly different color. And this all depends on where the viewer is. So in this bird, this is a magnificent bird out in um, Southeast Arizona. And it actually has areas of uh, purple um, iridescent feathers on the top. And then this shade of brilliant turquoise which is a series of colors in here you can see. And then also in the breast, uh, the abdomen and side area is a little bit of green and some brighter green along here. So this is what produces these brilliant jewel-like colors and it varies by gender and species. Mostly the males are gonna have this spectacular color and some species are much more brilliantly uh, jeweled than others. And the farther south you go out of North America, the, the birds become even more, uh, I would say, extravagant and uh, beautiful. So all hummingbirds, adult males versus the females and hatch years, what happens here is they differ in size, Many species though, the males are not larger. The females are actually larger. It's gonna vary, vary based on the species. The males usually have most brilliant color um, and the females are dull. Um, they're the ones sitting on the nests and have to be more um, camouflaged. And some species will have the same exact colors for males and females, but that, that's the rarity, that's not the normal. Their behaviors are very different as well. We're gonna talk a little bit about the behaviors um, and their feeding territories and their migration timing. Uh, males, those that migrate, first of all, the, well, the three species in the Bahamas do not migrate. Those that migrate, the males leave first in the springtime to go back to the breeding grounds and stake out their territories, followed by the females. Um, Males often attack other males quite often, and they actually beat, if they can catch them, they'll beat them. I saw one about a month or month and a half ago here um, at our house who got another male and was beating it with its beak like a sewing machine trying to kill it. So they might look beautiful and they might look like they are sweet, but all hummingbirds, they have to live and every minute of their day means they need food to make that happen. And, whoops, did I skip a slide? Okay, um, so Scott is gonna talk to you now and uh, cover a, some things about what we're gonna be going into detail about today. All right, thank you, Anne. So 
This lovely archipelago that you see here is the Lucayan archipelago, which consists of two political bodies. You have the, um, the Bahamas um, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. And we have three species that are native and resident to the Bahamas, one of them being endemic. Um, the Bahama wood star is a native species to the Bahamas, is also found in Turks and Caicos. And it has the widest distribution of all of the hummingbird species in the Bahamas. You can find this bird on virtually every island in the Bahamas except um, in Agua. The Cuban emerald is the largest hummingbird in the Bahamas. And this bird is found on the islands of Grand Bahama, Abaco, and Andrus. And historically, it was also found on New Providence before it was extirpated. The Inagua wood star is our endemic hummingbird found on the islands of Great and Little Inagua. And so um, we also have the, uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird that does pass through the Bahamas from time to time. And we often see this species on uh, um, Grand Bahama, but it has been seen on a couple of islands as well. So. So onto the Bahama wood star. Um, this is uh, one of my favorites, favorite birds, uh, that and the Cuban emerald. And of course, then the Inagua wood star took my heart over. But um, this bird has these, this gorgeous purple gorget. And you can see because of the details that the camera allows us that it's actually a series of purple and violet all mixed in. And it also has a slightly decurved bill. You'll probably see that a little bit better in some of the other pictures. Iridescent green on the head. The iridescent green is on the head. Right here on this one, that's mostly pollen. I'll show you a better picture where that green's showing up. Very cinnamon breast. And the tail feathers of the um, Bahama Woodstar male are longitudinally black and orange. I'll we'll show you a better picture of that in a minute. So keep these. Uh, characteristics in mind as you look at the next few slides. So here's a good example of an adult male showing, um, again, you've got this beautiful purple magenta uh, gorget. You've got the white area right below it, uh, cinnamon, uh, cinnamon uh, uh, in, in its uh, sides of its abdomen. But here is one of the big characteristics that a lot of people often miss. On the tail feathers of the male Bahama wood star, the outer tail feather starts off with black. And then the next two feathers, so R5, 4, and 3, are all going to have a shade of orange on, one, on a leading edge of the actual feather. So this one shows it the best. The outer edge of this particular feather is black while the inner edge is orange. And then the center ones are black, but it's this black and orange longitudinal striping that will help you determine some things, especially when you see uh, something that might be a developing um, into an adult male or to make sure that one is not a female. So here's a good picture that illustrates the differences between the adult males and adult female. These again show, this is the male and it's showing the character, characteristics we just discussed. And look at the, again, the, the uh, I guess, bronze or golden and black, golden and black. And then when we get to the female, look at her tail color uh, and, and direction. They are horizontally banded so that the top of these outer three feathers are a uh, golden brown, then you've got this black banding, and then the bottom is this golden color again. So it's only the outer three feathers on, on each side, but it's a horizontal banding, and that's an important thing. None of the Bahama wood stars have white tips on their tail at any part of their life cycle. That's another way to know if you're looking at a Bahama wood star versus some other possible bird. So this is a close-up of a uh, adult female. This is one that was on a nest. 
And she is um, a good example trying to show you, again, how this banding, horizontal banding looks on these outer three feathers, slightly on the fourth feather. Um, but again, you also will note that adult females will have a little bit of speckling in their gorget, but some of them also might have very, very white. Another male-female comparison, just to show you that what they both look like when they're perched. And here's a great example of the iridescent green on the top of the forehead of the male. You can see his uh, decurved bill, this gorgeous shades of coloring of um, his purple gorget, white cinnamon, and then the vertical uh, or longitudinal black and orange. The female by comparison looks really blah, poor thing. And she has very little iridescence on her, um, the brown head, uh, the white neck, and cinnamon wash on the breast. But she is the one that has to be taking care of the nest. So again, this is, this is a picture I took on Andros the last time I was there. And it's one of my favorite of a female. Um, she's not, she's close to being an adult. So this adult that I put on here is a misnomer, but she's just coming out of it. You'll see on her head, she still has some buffy edges to her feathers on her head. So she's just recently become an adult. And that coloring and detail is a good way to remember what the Bahama Woodstar looks like. Sometimes their neck will look this grayish color and that's fine. Um, anywhere from a very white to some speckles to light gray. Scott mentioned that some of the uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds do make their way to the Bahamas and they're not native, they're um, off their path of migration. And so I put in here some examples so you can see how similar they are to the Bahama wood star and ways that you can quickly tell the difference. This is an adult female uh, ruby throated on the left and adult female Bahama wood star. The key giveaway in each instance and which is usually visible with, your, with the naked eye, but definitely with a pair of binoculars, you see this orange black orange banding on the outer three retresses of the tail it's a Bahama wood star it, in the Bahamas. <laughs> um, in other words, if you see this uh, pattern um, it, in the Bahamas, that would be a Bahama wood star. And note the heavy, heavy uh, cinnamon color on uh, the abdomen. The adult female ruby-throated is basically all white in here, very little coloring. And again, look for the white tips on the outer three ret retresses. So this is a giveaway. If you see these white tips, it's not a Bahama wood star. These are some differences of, here's your Bahama wood star. Let me close this down. Here's your Bahama wood star on uh, upper right. And it's a first year female. So you'll see that she's got a little bit more cinnamon wash in her. Um, and these two, this is an adult, I mean, this is a hatchier female ruby throated and a hatchier male ruby throated. The young males of all species greatly resemble the females so that the, it is believed that helps them to stay away from being attacked by the adult males in their first year. Um, but they will, this young male greatly looks like this bird and they have just a hint of cinnamon wash, more so than the adult uh, female ruby thread we just saw, who has hardly any cinnamon wash. So that cinnamon wash can confuse you when you're looking at a Bahama wood star, because you might think, well, that's a Bahama wood star, but again, look for the white tips on the tail. So if it has white tips, it's not a Bahama wood star. All right, the Cuban emerald, this is a spectacular bird, most, uh, most definitely. It's one of the, um, my favorites. It's the one that started my uh, photographic journey. I was taking pictures of ruby-throated hummingbirds in the yard um, here in North Carolina. And when I went with my husband to go to Andros, 
Um, and I took my camera, hoping to find the hummingbird, and uh, I was hooked when I saw these this particular species. It's not shy. Um, it's got a beautiful emerald color. This entire area, uh, the gorget and the breast, are iridescently uh, shaped so that these colors range from a bright blue to a dark blue to turquoise and it's just magnificent. There is a little bit of orange or red on the underside of their beak and their tail is bronze colored. I'll show you a good example of their tails here in a second. This is the, one of the pictures that I took on my very first trip to Andros and one of the birds that got me hooked. Um, it is a first year or ending a first year um, existence. It's a young male, but look at these buffy edges to the feathers. And that's one of the giveaways that it's not quite an adult male. Again, Cuban emerald male, adult male on the left, adult female on the right. And these are at century plants on east end of Grand Bahama or were on the east end of Grand Bahama. You can see again, this beautiful iridescent blue and the green, um, his white uh, postocular um, eye spot. And you can see that little bit of orange underneath of his bill. Very long tail, deeply forked, long wings. And the female by comparison is very dull, mostly grayish from underneath. The tail is much shorter in, uh, in relation to the length of the bird. And um, it's, just, it's just not as spectacular. You just, when you see it with the naked eye, it just looks a little bit of green and a lot of gray. Uh, one to say something about century plants, you will very rarely see female Cuban emeralds at century plants because these are the favorites of the adult males and they defend them with, uh, with their knives out. They're just, they usually uh, perch right underneath of the uh, century plant and a, a palmetto palm nearby and immediately attack anything that comes near it. Here's another good example of the male and female Cuban emeralds. And the male on the right, very deeply for tail, but look at the coloring. It goes from a lighter bronze down to a very dark bronze, whereas the female tail goes from like a golden color down to black. So the tail colors and the shapes can tell you if they're male and female as well. Plus on the female, you've got this uh, gray breast area that's uh, definitely not a male. This is what happens on the right hand side. This is what happens when a bird, when the iridescence, the light does not strike it or your camera and it appears black. Many times you will see a hummingbird in a tree or on a limb and it looks all black. And that's most likely a Cuban emerald because it has so many iridescent feathers that if they don't hit you just right and the light doesn't hit it just right, it just looks like a black bird. And again, this is on East End of Grand Bahama, the other favorite plant that I found that they just were uh, uh, addicted to. And that is a very small powder puff that grew, did grow all on the far East End of Grand Bahama. And here's your female by comparison. The Anagua wood star, uh, again, spectacular bird. Um, it has a, uh, the male, has, a, I mean, the male has a longer tail compared to the Bahama wood star um, and has a unique wire shape that we're gonna talk about and show in just a second. It's got this iridescent forecrown, these little tiny pinkish reddish dots above its eye and above its beak. And it has completely different vocalizations. Um, I like in the vocalizations that this bird makes to like a whistle whinny. Um, so it kind of, it's kind of like a, the, the bird's going, uh, -de 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 -de. I mean, it sounds just like a little whinny uh, from a horse. Um, if you take a look at, this is what the lyre shaped tail looks like. So a great picture of an adult male uh, looking at him from the underside and note how he also has these black and orange longitudinally uh, colored uh, retresses but these retresses are lyre shaped. They make this shape and they go outward. So these tail feathers are slightly longer than the Bahama wood star and this lyre shape. 
notice that this, the, its gorget is black. That's because there's no sunlight coming through and or anywhere. So there is no iridescence. But that's a great look at what the underside of an adult male Inagua looks like. And a couple more samples. Um, one of these is um, uh, just forming or just getting into adulthood. On the, uh, the picture of him on the other side, he's still growing his gorget. Um, but the little bit of purple up in here is starting. But again, look at these tail feathers and look at the structure. Five, four, three, two and one. It's missing something in here because it's going through um, um, finishing up molting. And another, even when the Inago Woodstar's tails aren't spread out like this to get at a flower, when they're together, you can still see how much longer it is than the Bahama Woodstar. And you can see that it still has that liar shape. These are, um, this is one of my favorite photos and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, and this is the female Inago Woodstar very similar to the female Bahama wood star, except different calls. And it also, on its breast, the female Anaga wood star, this cinnamon um, almost goes together like a zipper. And in the Bahama wood star, there's like a white stripe down there on the female. Um, the, this guy is uh, the same as this bird. <laughs> And I wanted to get this bird. I had 13 of my species for my book and I wanted the Inagua Woodstar to be my 14th and my first trip to Inagua at Christmas of 2019, sorry, right after New Year's of 2019. Um, Casper, Bros and Tara, they all, they, I had lots of help um, trying to find the adult male and but I could never get a good perching picture. And in my book, I always wanted a, um, uh, a, a what do you call it? A, um, an adult male, an adult female, and try to have them um, in perching and flying positions for the book. And I was disappointed. So I went back the next year in, uh, in Christmas of 2019, when I went to the Bahamas with my husband for his work. And I spent some time um, on Inagua. And again, I was really disappointed. They had had some kind of weather problems that, that fall. Uh, Tara and I were talking about the other day. We can't remember really what it was, whether it was a drought or a lot of rain. But the adult males were almost, I, I couldn't find them in any of the regular places where I would think that they should have been. And I spent three or four days looking and could not find it. And finally, one day at dinner um, with Tara, she said, well, I've got an adult male in my yard. And this is the picture. And she helped me. I spent four, four full days, uh, more than eight hours a day, trying to get pictures of him perched. And he was, um, uh, uh, not cooperative until the very last afternoon when I had to leave. I had to leave for the airport, the, I guess the next morning or wherever it was. And I was running out of daylight and Tar was sitting near me, helping me to tell me where the bird was landing so I wouldn't have to move and move all my equipment. And these are the results of Tara helping me with these perched pictures of the adult Anagua. An interesting thing about the uh, 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 Anagua female and young male, again, the young males greatly resemble the females and the females have this uh, horizontal banding just like the Bahama wood stars and the horizontal banding is orange, black, orange. And the same thing is similar over here. This is a developing, uh, it's a first year male um, he's got some of the purple starting in here, some of the purple starting above his head. And the tail feathers are just, when they finish molting, they will be the long black and gold, I mean, or black and orange striped. But right now he is still in his development into an adult. 
You'll notice also he's perched on a leaf and I've noticed over the years with many of the species in my book that the young first year birds perch on either the flower itself or on the leaf nearby. Um, and I gather that's because they don't have the muscle built up yet to fly all the time. Here's a male and molt, adult male and molt. But again, you can see this lyre shaped tail nicely. Same thing here. Some different feeding behaviors. The, um, all hummingbirds, okay. The breeding season, the adult males are going to select the best flowers and the insects. So they are going to pick out the top places to eat and they're gonna defend it like for life or death. Females and hatcher males are relegated to the less preferred food sources. So if you know a species and you can figure out which is the preferred species, you'll be more likely to find whether you're looking for adult males or not. The females are only allowed into the male's breeding territory when the male wants to breed. And the feeding behaviors, adult males tend to use the higher areas of the plant. They'll fly right in towards the top of the plant. They'll go around it. Females usually approach from the lower part of the plant and work their way upwards, kind of hiding within the plant. And both genders tend to watch over their territory from perches, which they usually keep reusing the same perch. This is a picture of nectar stealing. And the reason it's called that is because these birds, since they co evolved with these long tubular flowers over the year, many thousands of years. These birds are capable and we know that they can put their beak down in here and extend their tongue and get to the nectar at the very base of the flower. However, there are many instances, especially in birds Caribbean in, in the listservs where they're saying that or they've got pictures of hummingbirds from the Southern areas that are getting nectar out of these um, holes and it's called nectar stealing. But one of the thing about this is that nobody really knows for sure. And they assume that they're using slits that were made from other birds such as banana quits um, or insects that are making slits in the flower. But the, this particular bird, you can see his beak is in the tube of this flower. And there is a slit over on this flower and a slit on this flower. And I watched him make all three of these, but I couldn't get him make, when he made these two slits, his body was in the way, and then he made this slit. So I've actually just documented this and photographed it, of uh, Ruby Throated actually making the slit. This is a recently fledged, ruby-throated male um, making a slit. So my question is, is it uh, a learned behavior or is it instinctive? Nesting and behavior, the, um, the, the nests of both wood stars are just absolutely phenomenal. I think they look like uh, stained glass. The hummingbird a species native to the Bahamas breed year round. So you can find these nests uh, in a very wide range of months. And the approximate size, if you look at the picture of this nest in my hand, it's about an inch and a half across. You can see she's got some fluff and she's lining the inside of her nest. This is a Bahama wood star just landed with more plant fluff and she's gonna place it in here. What I want you to notice on this, take a look at all these little tiny spider webs. These spider webs are all throughout it and they are actually what is anchoring this nest to this tree. The, over the first four days that I was able to watch uh, a Bahama wood star um, on her nest, there's two eggs usually laid in each nest and a series of behaviors that I documented in the book. But one of the things that happened is right before her first egg hatched, she started running in place rapidly, like, like, a, like she was running on a treadmill. And it went on for like 10 or 15 minutes. And she got up to fly away. And when she did, I saw this young chick had just hatched. Um, when she flew back, this is the first feeding of that chick. And then I left.
um, and didn't stay anywhere near her or them or whatever, and found out from the owner of the property that, that she um, uh, did successfully fledge two chicks. This is on Anagua, the last time I was there. And this, she had one chick. This is about three days old. And I want you to take a look at this picture because she's got the beak down the throat of the bird, but you can actually see the beak because the skin is so translucent. So you can actually see it down inside. Some ethical things about uh, being around a hummingbird nest. I won't go through all of these, but I do wanna mention in the first two hours at dawn and dusk, stay away from them. Um, they and their parents need to, I mean, the mother and the chicks need to get the food um, from being in torpor and it's really crucial. I also recommend using social media sparingly so that you don't um, uh, have people going there that don't really know how to be safe around um, hummingbirds and hummingbird nests and never use a flash on a hummingbird in a nest, it can blind them. Just some equipment, uh, basic equipment and more advanced. Um, I just like to share that this, um, this is my, my camouflage suit, camouflage drape, and it makes a big difference if you can, if you can get uh, camouflaged. And on to, I believe it's Scott. Hello again. <laughs> All right, so, um, Attracting birds to your yard, attracting hummingbirds to your yard. That can be a very fun process. I know a lot of people, they like to use the bird feeders, um, the nectar feeders, because hummingbirds are nectarivores, which means they like to eat nectar. But finding the right flowers um, for your yard is, is crucial um, to attract um, a variety of species of butterflies as well as hummingbirds to your yard. So if you notice, if you know about hummingbirds, at least in the, the West Indies, hummingbirds like um, brightly colored flowers with uh, long uh, corollas and uh, um, flowers that produce decent amounts of nectar. So these are some examples of uh, flowers that we find in the Bahamian pinelands and in the Bahamian coppice forests. You have the five finger, um, which is um, a very special plant. It is the, um, I guess, the mascot plant of the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve in Eleuthera in the Bahamas. You have wild guava. Um, you have the Ernodia. This is Ernodia littoralis. Sorry if I'm speaking in scientific terms, but some plants, uh, they really don't have a lot of common names to them. And then you have this one here, which is a species of Galactea. But if you notice, these plants have um, these long corollas and uh, open, have tiny openings. These are plants that mostly have co-evolved with hummingbirds as well as other, um, other pollinators. And so um, Anne mentioned that um, she sees hummingbirds or we sometimes we see hummingbirds nectar robbing. Now, some people would ask, well, what does nectar robbing mean? If you see a hummingbird go to one of these flowers and they don't, um, they don't go through the normal, uh, the normal way. So nectar robbing just means that the bird is, okay, so let me explain this a little bit. When a hummingbird, when a bird, when hummingbird comes to a flower, it usually would insert its flower, its, its bill into the opening of the flower. And these flowers have evolved in which they have their pollen at the tip of the flower. So when the hummingbird probes, puts his bill in the flower, the pollen would attach to its face or its head, and then it would fly to another flower and it would help to pollinate it. But in the pictures that Anne showed, the birds were avoiding that and they were just cutting open the flower to get to the nectar. And so that is why it's called nectar robbing or nectar stealing. But um, going back to this slide, if you wanna attract hummingbirds to your yards, planting the right species is going to be important. And like I mentioned, these are amazing flowers that you could find um, in the Bahamas, as well as possibly parts of the Caribbean um, that you could use um, to attract um, hummingbirds to your yards. 
Other examples would be things like cocoa plums um, and the century plant, also known as agaves. Um, these plants produce uh, large flowers when their stalk come, when they come into inflorescence, they have this long stalk that um, produces these flowers that produce tons and tons of nectar, super attractive to nectar, nectar feeding birds like banana quits and uh, um, hummingbirds <clears throat> and Cape May warblers, etc. So these are the types of plants that you may want in your yard uh, to attract these species. Tara is going to sh share some things about her yard because it's, um, I consider it very unique. And she's going to talk about what and why we think. Hi again. So um, this little guy, my, he's also, he's my, actually my pet. I call him Buddy because he's very frequent, frequent in my yard, visiting my yard. And when the aloe was in blossom, he was just all over that aloe tree. And uh, well, the, the, the other, um, the geiger is, I also have the geiger that's around in the area, but not, it's more at the front in the neighbor's yard. So he, he likes that as well. And then he likes the, the noni. That's, I think that's his, his favorite because I have like about six of those trees in my yard. So he's just all over those trees. And then I noticed um, at Grenville Suite, this is another birding hotspot in Inagua. Um, this lady, she has um, quite a bit of flower trees and she has some fruit trees as well. And uh, she has the yellow elders, she has hibiscus, bougainvillea and bridal bouquet. And she also has sapodilly. I've noticed that the, the Inago Woodstar, he, they, he was at the, one of the male was at the, the sapodilly tree and he was on the little flower blossoms. And then she had um, pomegranate. She had the, the um, noni as well and she had sugar apple. So she has a lot of fruit trees in the yard. But I know that my buddy, he loves the, the, the noni. Like I say, he's frequent uh, visiting the yard. Like, I mean, I have him time that when I can go out and really, you know, actually take photos of him. Yeah, so these are some of the plants that in my area that I know they love. And by the way, uh, in Tara's yard, the adult male will be feeding inside of this plant and she can literally go up to maybe inches away from him. He's so used to her. Erica? So Scott discussed the uh, native plants that hummingbirds will find in the field. And uh, Tara had a lot of interesting fruit trees that are important for the hummingbirds as well. Uh, we must remember that many hummingbirds frequent our private gardens because there they will find a variety of native and imported nectar producing plants, some of which I would highlight, and actually I just picked a few before I came to the session here. So we begin with the uh, 3F plants, I call them. Uh, on the left, we have the fire spike. And many of these plants, uh, I, these three plants are found throughout many of the Caribbean islands. So the fire spike uh, is on the left, which is very attractive. It has also a very small tube, not very deep, but then we are all familiar in the, with the center picture and that is the firecracker. Uh, and on the right hand side, I have the fire bush. Now in the background there, I have trained this fire bush into a tree, which is now about 25 feet high. And it's, it's very, very uh, interesting for my male, uh, Bahama Woodstar, who actually, when I took this photo yesterday, he chased me away from the bush. So <laughs> all three are non-native, non-invasive, except for the firecracker, which you have to keep somewhat under control. They are all easily propagated from cuttings and hummingbirds just love the tubular shapes of the blossoms. You would have noticed many of Anne's photos were taken with birds feeding on these three plants. Next picture, please, Anne. 
Uh, these are the bromeliads. Many of the spectacular bromeliads you find in private gardens are most likely imported. They are not native, but not invasive either. Flowering time and nectar production is mostly short lived, but for Anne's photos, timing in December was just perfect. Uh, we also have several native bromeliad species in the Bahamas. Actually, I think there are about 60 different species called, not yet Anne, stay. The, the one in the center is a Tillandsia, which can be found in the pylons and mangroves, uh, wetlands. And they are usually epiphytes, which means they are air plants, while the imported bromeliads are mostly terrestrial. Uh, also to keep in mind is the fact that you should remove the mother plant once she has blossomed, as she will dry out and die. However, she has made sure to have produced several offspring along her side, which will produce a new flower spike in the next season. Next slide, please. This is called the devil's fiddle or red bird cactus. And you can see the uh, shape of the blossom is very close to the shape of a bird with a beak. This plant is a magnet for hummingbirds. They will return over and over due to the fact that it replenishes nectar very quickly. I have planted many six to eight foot, uh, six to eight cuttings in large terracotta pots, providing a couple of dozen flower heads at a time. The pots also allow me to place them in different areas of my garden when I see hummingbirds feeding more in one area or another. Okay, and uh, we have some live flowers here now. I think, can you see them? Yes, I think. Um, these are actually uh, penta, and the penta is available as a uh, annual in our local nursery. And they come in different colors, uh, bloom all year round, and the uh, hummingbirds are really attracted to them. And you will have many visits of hummingbirds in your garden. I always prefer the red ones, and I think so do the hummingbirds. So I have here a native wild coffee. This, uh, these blossoms are almost closed up this afternoon. It's already late. And uh, since we left many native trees standing in our bird sanctuary here at home, like mahogany, poisonwood, gumbo limbo, Cinecourt, etc. We have a tremendous amount of native wild coffee bushes growing in the shade of those of those trees. So they produce very small white flowers uh, and are usually frequented by bees. But the hummingbirds still find the time and their way to them uh, when the bees are not around. And there are so many bushes, of course. The coffee bush produces a berry which contains a small nut that the early settlers are said to have roasted for their morning cup. The Latin name for this coffee bush is a little scary, uh, probably an indication what coffee does to you. The Latin name is Psychotria nervosa. Uh, last not least, I was able to find uh, two Geiger trees in our yard that were still having lots of flowers, uh, but they're also turning into the fruit. As you can see, the fruit eventually will be like this. This is the fruit. This is one of my favorite trees. It's actually called Cordia sebestena. Uh, you can find it all the way from Grand Bahama. Tara mentioned it in her yard or her neighbor's yard, all the way to Inagua. It is easy to grow from these white soft fruits that drop to the ground. And I think they look best when you plant three fruits together and you get a very substantial bush or even tree. Uh, how did it get the name Geiger? Well, 
Good old James Audubon. One weekend in 1832, when James Audubon visited Key West, where he sketched 18 of the native birds throughout the weekend with the vegetation they could be found in. He glanced into his host's neighbor's yard and noticed the brilliant scarlet flower clusters of this beautiful tree with the leathery leaves. He immediately sketched it with a hummingbird perching in it. When he asked for the name of the tree, nobody could give him the answer except uh, the Latin word cordia. He didn't like it. So he asked for the name of the person in whose yard he saw the tree. The neighbor was a ship's captain and a pirate by the name of John Geiger. So Mr. Audubon determined that Geiger would be the name of the tree. I think that's it, Anne. Okay. And let's go back to, oops, back, 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 back. I'm sorry. Getting used to this. All righty. I'm sorry. I thought it was still sitting where I left it, but okay. So, Erica, you were going to talk about the feeders. Okay. Uh, it's very important to include hummingbird feeders and a gallon of fresh sugar water into your hurricane preparations. I learned from experience. You need one cup of fresh sugar water into your uh, <coughs> sugar water into your hurricane preparations. You need one cup of white sugar to four cups of water. Do not use red dye. Your feeder has quite a bit of red on it anyway. Just fill a gallon bottle with sugar solution and store it with your hurricane items. After the storm passes and it is safe to go outside, hang feeders in areas you decided on prior to the storm. Make sure you always hang them in shady areas. A little bit about cleaning. It is absolutely necessary that you clean your feeders every four to five days as fungus may develop within the feeder and the ports. This fungus may build up in the beak and throat of hummingbirds. They may be unable to breathe and may eventually die. Here is a suggested cleaning process. Take all removable parts off the feeder, drain sugar solution and rinse. Place all parts in a bowl with a solution of Dawn dish, deter dish detergent. This is the only safe dish detergent to use, Dawn. You're using it for uh, getting oil of, of birds and, and it's just very safe. And use hot water, place them in the bowl then brush all accessible parts with a foam bottle brush or soft toothbrush. Then let soak for two hours. Rinse cold and make sure all suds are gone prior to filling the feeder again. Now I believe Anne, you're talking about the ant cup, the uh, accessory to the feeder. Yes, um, the ant cup is um, this contraption up here, and they, they come in different shapes and sizes, but what it is, it's a reservoir to hold water. So when the ants get attracted to any of the drippings down here, they crawl up and they come down into this. And then the only way for them to get from there to the feeder is to go through this moat of water and it, they die. Um, and so this is crucial because Ants are deadly to hummingbirds. They cannot digest the hard exoskeleton of an ant. So if they get any of that exoskeleton in them, it collects in the crop and will end up killing them. So an ant cup, it's a, a very good investment because it's hard to keep up. Once ants find where your feeders are, it's very difficult to keep them off the feeder. Another thing is please never put things on the feeder like Vaseline or something trying to keep the ants off. That can also harm your hummingbirds. 
And the hummingbirds love water features. And Erica has uh, some phenomenal uh, water features in her, her property. And I want you to look closely at this video off our back deck here a few summers ago. And it's really fast, but the hummingbird's gonna come flying out of this spray of water. So here we go. There he goes. <laughs> and goes back over to it. And this is all still getting spray. And then he comes back down. And so it's just a shade that they really do enjoy uh, bath in the heat just as much as all of us. Erica, um, feral cats. All right. <clears throat> this photo shows our cattery, which we built approximately 10 years ago adjacent to our bird sanctuary. It is a known fact that cats kill more than 2.4 billion, that's with a B, birds each year in America. And uh, especially vulnerable, of course, are nests, nestlings, recently fledged and still flightless birds. So we have red-legged thrushes, thick-billed vireos, common ground doves, black-whiskered vireos, Antillian bullfinches, Lasagras flycatcher nesting in our garden. And just one roaming cat would decimate these native bird populations. We have trapped 50 cats in this area since we built. My husband and I love cats and we provide them with all the luxuries and attention a cat should have in a home. After trapping, we take the cat to the Humane Society for spay and neuter and a checkup. Then we assess its character and demeanor and integrate the animal into the appropriate colony within the cattery. We have nine colonies with three or four cats each. There are comfortable chairs where we can sit and give them attention and affection on a regular basis and also eventually decide on a name for each new arrival. All cats have access to the cattery's attic via little ladders. You can see them going up uh, right there, yes. You see a couple of cats looking at us here from the bottom. Uh, and they also can lounge in the sun on fenced in outside patios. There are heating pads available in each colony when the temperature goes below 60. Some of our cats have lived out their lives and to date we have a cattery population of 33. When Greg Butcher from Audubon and his wife stayed with us for birding a couple of years ago, they took videos and photos of the cattery as they were working with Audubon on their Cats Indoors campaign. They intended to use our cattery concept as an alternate solution to spay, neuter, and release. And so in summary, if you're trying to attract hummingbirds to your yard, remember what we said about the types of plants, insects are necessary, try to reduce their predators, and if you can, provide a water source. And um, I just have to say, this is one of my very first pictures of that trip to Andros the, the, back in 2000, January of 2010, which made me get addicted to the hummingbirds of the Bahamas. A few words about Dorian before we leave. Um, Dorian, as you know, hit the Bahamas, category five. Abaco and Grand Bahama took the, the brunt of it and it pummeled Grand Bahama for 48 long hours. What I wanna to mention to you is that about the hummingbirds. The hummingbirds, um, you, first of all, I used to spend, because my husband's work on Grand Bahama, I would spend about four full days out on the east of, of Grand Bahama and uh, just doing my photos for the Cuban Emerald. And the area um, was devastated. It used to be 60 miles of pine forest and it was gone. Uh, this is the 20 foot watermark that you'll see as you drive all along. Any trees that didn't die or get blown over were later uh, killed from the uh, saltwater intrusion. So it is a devastating. We know that it was horrible for people. And we all know all of that. 
but this is just a reminder of how bad it is for all of the critters and plants that are there as well. The, when I went out there four months after uh, the hurricane and went out and did my four days, I never saw one Cuban emerald. I never saw any bird except for an egret down by the ocean. And it looked just like this all over. It was pretty devastating. Scott is going to tell us a little bit about what he found with Dorian, and then Erica will wrap up about Dorian. And so um, I visited uh, I visited Grand Bahama with my colleagues, um, with my BNT colleagues, in 2020 in February 2020 to do assessments on um, bird populations as well as uh, the vegetation um, of the island uh, post Dorian. Uh, we found very few birds, especially in the areas that were hit by Dorian, obviously. Um, hummingbirds, we did not find any hummingbirds except for when we went to Garden of the Groves. Seems as though there were some hummingbirds that, that, um, that made it. And thanks to Erica, and uh, um, and all the work that that she and her husband and everybody else has done to have maintained that habitat. Uh, there were still some hummingbirds that were around, but in the pinelands we didn't come across any hummingbirds, and that just goes to show how uh, detrimental the storm really can be. What people don't realize is that a hurricane um, hurricanes are serious storms, but it's not necessarily the hurricane. That, um, that, that is the major culprit for uh, the deaths of these uh, of birds. Um, it's also the after effects of the hurricane that can lead to the major problems. Um, these birds like to eat nectar um, and insects. And when a hurricane passes through, it oftentimes blows down uh, fruit, it blows away flowers, and it takes a little while for these plants to recover. And if you know about hurricane uh, hummingbirds, they have high metabolism, so they can't go very, very long without food. And so they end up, they can possibly die from starvation in a very, very short period of time. And this is why you want to have, um, after a hurricane, if you can, you want to set up your bird feeders. Naturally, you want to make sure that you and your family members and everybody else are safe. But you also want to set up uh, bird feeders, uh, nectar feeders to help um, these animals out because it's a stressful time. Um, plants like palms, they recover quickly. And so that gives them, gives the birds a chance to get something to eat in a, in a little while. Um, but they are gonna need help for the, um, during that period um, until the plants can catch itself. Hopefully the plants can catch itself. Um, Hurricane Dorian, however, was one of those storms that um, is still a question mark as to if the uh, the pineland will recover um, from such a catastrophic event. So, and I'm sorry, there my mouse wouldn't behave um, and clicked us out. I'll get us right back in there. I'm sorry. Um, no worries. Okay, we're almost finished. Let's see. Maybe scroll all the way down to the end. Yeah, we sure will. We have one more photo. Yes, we just have one more. Scott, how long did you say, I just want to recap, um, that you went and did that after Hurricane Dorian? It was your first trip there to see birds? We visited Hurricane Dorian in February of 2020. So that was about, about five months after the storm. Yeah. And so the good thing is that we were seeing plants recover, understory plants recovering. The palms um, uh, were recovering. We also saw some morning glories in the pinelands that were growing and actually in flower. Um, so you have some species of plants that, that do recover quickly from storms. And that's one of the things that I would like to mention to everybody. Um, if you are in a hurricane, in in uh, in an area where hurricane activity uh, um, is frequent, like the Bahamas and like the Caribbean, uh, you may want to look for plants that can that can bounce back from a storm um, quickly, 
um, because the faster these plants can bounce back, the faster they can produce flowers and fruit, which means the better they are for um, a lot of the bird life. And a lot of these native plants have evolved in this type of environment. So planting natives is a great idea to do um, to help save these birds during those uh, during these hard times. Good point. And Erica, let's see, you're going to talk to us a little bit about Christmas bird count. Yeah, I'm talking about the Christmas bird, two Christmas bird counts following uh, Hurricane Dorian. So we have conducted Christmas bird counts on Grand Bahama Island for over 25 years, but never included the portion of the island out east past the Casuarina Bridge, which spans the Grand Lucayne waterway in the center of the island. The initial CBC was established by legendary birdie, birder Tony White, and he chose to draw the 17 mile circle around the Rand Nature Center our first national park on the island, located in the city of Freeport. Hence the Christmas bird count in Freeport. In 2017, we added a second Christmas bird count day and chose to cover the Western part of the island due to the variety of bird life out West. Four months after Dorian, during the first week of January, 2020, we conducted our 2019 Christmas bird count as we were anxious to see the number of species that had survived the storm. Keep in mind the largest devastation by a 20 foot tidal surge and 180 miles per hour sustained winds over 48 hours happened between the eastern end of the island and the Casuarina Bridge, 60 miles to the west. Just like you saw in Anne's photos, 60 miles of prime pine forest out east were gone. The storm turned to the north just past the Casuarina Bridge and spared the remaining western part of Grand Bahama Island extensive devastation. Although there was still up to six feet of flooding in Freeport, water dissipated fairly rapidly there and winds had decreased as well. So most homes and gardens and bird habitat uh, was still intact, especially along the South Shore. <clears throat> and some areas did not suffer any damages at all there. The 2019 count included 30 Grand Bahama Island birders. And we were joined by a group of team leaders that had been with us during most CBCs since the early days. Dr. Woody Bracey, one of his accomplishments, of course, was the big year with 242 species. And then we had Bruce Hallett, the author and photographer of Birds of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. We had Bruce Purdy, who had moved to Florida, but never tired to be our compiler. Uh, and we had two special guests during that Christmas bird count, during the pre-count get together. And those were Anne and Sydney Maddock. We celebrated relief and hope when we were able to record 64 species in West End and 88 species in the Freeport area. Numbers that were only 20% below previous counts. One of the highlights of the Freeport count were 19 Cuban Emerald Hummingbirds in the Freeport area. Here's, this is a group picture of the participants of the 2019 Post-Dorian CBC. This past January, we conducted our 2020 count under COVID restrictions and with no big guns, as I call them, traveling to assist us. We counted 90 species in the Freeport area and 63 in West End. Once again, hummingbirds filled our hearts <laughs> with hope and joy. Bridget Davis and her team had discovered a Bahama Woodstar nest containing one nestling and, and a parent attending. That's beautiful, Erica. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really good news that the hummingbirds Thank you. coming back and survived. I know it's emotional. You guys have been through so much in Grandpa Home and Abaco with the hurricane devastation. So it's really, really good news. Shared some great, great, great information also about 
It's got the direct and indirect effects of hurricanes. You know, birds can be held, killed outright by the hurricanes, but then also the indirect effects in the days and weeks afterwards where they have trouble finding food. So for sure you should have um, a large bag of sugar as part of your hurricane recovery supplies. Um, 20 pound bags so you can keep the hummingbirds well provisioned, have some feeders ready to go. You can make the um, nectar in advance and just keep it in your refrigerator uh, or just try to keep it cold. And then um, as Erica said, put the feed feeders out. We sent uh, a couple thousand bird feeders out after the last big hurricanes, Irma and Maria in, in 2017. And so um, those were really helpful to um, lots of people in all the islands that were impacted by those hurricanes. We sent feeders as well to Erica. And so um, hopefully that's helping now and will help in the future, you know, with big storms and hurricanes that people will be ready with feeders and food. So thanks for the excellent presentation. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. So I hope the panelists will stay on to answer some questions. Um, um, so I just want to make, sorry. Yeah, sorry. no, no, go ahead, Scott. I'm um, just going to make a comment. Um, if you are going to use bird feeders, please don't use honey as, right. A, right. as a, a sweetener. Um, honey contains a bunch of stuff in it, and that could lead to um, more fungal growth and bacterial growth in the feeder, and that can kill the bird. So I know you want to help the bird out, but if you're going to help the bird out, it's best to use just the, the, the sugar, the, um, uh, the white sugar, or yeah, the white sugar to, uh, and make the sugar solution using that. But don't use honey at yeah. all. And, and like Erica mentioned, don't put no dye in the, in the, in the liquid as well. Okay. Right, yeah, the dye is not necessary and don't use brown sugar either. It's really best to use white mm -hmm. sugar. All right, so um, Chris Johnson from the Bahamas is asking, what are the ideal conditions for photography of these hummingbirds, as well as ideal shutter speeds, aperture, and so forth? Oh, yeah. Ideal conditions. The Bahamas have beautiful weather all the time. So the, it's usually, of course, it's great if it's not as windy, it helps. Um, I think it depends on your shutter speed. Most of the pictures that you see of action photos not perched, my shutter speed's around one two thousandth to one four thousandth of a second. Um, but it's also dependent on what lenses you're using. So the lens is really going to help determine what, what you do. Um, and for instance, um, Erica, and I believe Scott, you also, they, have, they take really good photos with a much smaller, um, very modern, uh, uh, they're, they're not the instant cameras of, of old, they're really good um, digital cameras. And so those can take uh, good photos. If you're trying to take photo quality, like what I was showing you here, it's gonna depend on your lens. I use a 300 millimeter lens um, that's very fast and um, the speeds are, uh, and I have to be about four feet away from the bird. Okay, and here's another question. Um, hello from Trinidad and Tobago. I love this presentation. I've been planting various plants in my garden to attract hummingbirds, but many of these plants struggle with pests, mealybugs, scale, white flies, etc. especially my pentas. How can I ensure my, my plants, that these plants thrive without using pesticides? Soap. Erica, do you have some tips? God. Well, we have, we in the Bahamas, we have a neem plantation and neem produces uh, uh, non-poisonous, uh, I don't call them pesticides, but uh, uh, fight us against uh, mealybugs and ants and things like that. They specifically uh, create a mixture and uh, you can find neem on the internet and they will send, they will mail it to you. Excellent suggestion. Yeah, I buy it up here. I buy it up here as well and put it on yeah. my plants to take care of. It's called abaconine. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Scott, Tara, anybody else have comments about keeping these pests off your plants? Um, no, I think that 
Um, Erica answered the, the question correctly. I mean, um, I don't have nothing next. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and uh, somebody else is asking, how long did the sugar solution last in the refrigerator? Off the top of my head, I wanna say it's a week to two weeks. I'd have to check it out, check it again though. I haven't looked at that in a while. Does yeah. anybody else know? That's about it. Yeah. The way I try to remember it is if you open up a bottle of Pepsi or Coca-Cola and you put the cap back on, how long would you keep it in the refrigerator before you try it again? Because that's about, I mean, what it is, the, the sugar water just becomes, uh, it doesn't necessarily get sickly, but it becomes less tasteful. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, any other last questions? for Anne, for Erica, for Tara, for Scott. That was really a comprehensive webinar where you guys covered a lot of ground. Hummingbird biology, um, native plants, introduced plants that are good for hummingbirds, how to feed them, take care of them. We're getting lots of nice comments in the chat. Thank you for the presentations, really good information. So uh, I would just like to thank Ann Maddock again and congratulations on your book. Do visit her website and um, you can purchase a copy of the book yourself. This would make a great gift for people in your family that are hummingbird enthusiasts. Um, buy it now, save it for the next holiday or birthday. Um, it's a gorgeous book. Uh, I, think, I think that's about it. Anybody have any other last comments or information to share? I just want to thank everybody and thank you, Lisa. This has been a great opportunity to share some of these details with people that they rarely ever get a chance to see and understand. Um, so it, it, I, I do appreciate how, how, how wide the reach is of your group. Thank you so much. And yeah, the uh, photos that you shared were absolutely stunning. I learned so much about all the tiny details of identifying males, females, first year birds and so forth. So thank you for all that great information. I just wanna say thank you, Anne, for having us on the call. Thank you um, for this, all this hard work that you put in. Wow, this is over 10 years of, of photography and it really shows in the detail of your, your photos. I, I, am, I am really impressed. Um, I look forward to getting, uh, purchasing one of your books and uh, um, letting my wife, me and my wife, show our little girl um, these amazing little jewels of the Caribbean. So, Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Well, hi, hi, my turn. Yeah, go ahead, Tara. Hey, Ann, I just want to say thanks for having me. It was a pleasure being here. And um, I want to say congratulations on your great accomplishment. I'm sure it's going to be very successful. Well, it's the Bahamas that got it all going. Uh, I have to tell you. Well, well, I guess I won't see you back here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll be back. If my husband's work carries us there next winter, um, I'll be back with the camera and the lens. OK, sounds good. And I think you need to uh, head out to some other Caribbean islands as well and photograph some of the other, start your next book. Yeah. That's the next book. The next book is uh, going to be uh, some additional birds in the Caribbean. And it, I want to get down uh, to Cuba for the bee hummingbird. Mm -hmm. Got to get to Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Lesser Antilles. Yeah. We all have different hummingbirds. hummingbirds. If you need a partner on, you can yeah. hit me up. <laughs> I <laughs> will. Carry your equipment. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right. Thanks again to everybody for sharing this, this fantastic webinar. And thank you to everybody for joining us. We're so happy to have you. And uh, stay in touch. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. You do.